Thanks, Adriana. Thank you. So I just thought I'd kick off with a little bit of um, a little bit from the book. So the book is goes through um, every organ in your body one by one. Um, and obviously my favorite organ is the gut. Um, and one of the things we maybe as humans, but definitely as British people don't like talking about other than sex are the state of our bowels. <laughs> so the gastrointestinal system is a long and winding road housed between the mouth and anus. Chemical reactions take here to break down the food that you eat into liquid you drink into small particles to be absorbed by the bloodstream and to be used by energy by you. When ill health arises, the gut is the first place I look for answers. Our gut takes on wear and tear from the stresses of life and how we feel plays an important part in how we eat and how we feel depends largely on the amount of stress that we have in our lives. Eating is the most emotional thing that we as humans do sometimes seven or more times a day. And the food we eat or don't eat makes up the health of your gut. It is said what you are, what you eat, and more recently you are what you don't absorb. But I like to say a more accurate description would be, you are what you don't excrete. Flashback to the Gillian McKeith days when she was scraping around in plastic boxes full of poo, shouting at overweight, mortified souls who probably wish they'd read the contract small print before their poo became household viewing. Until Gillian McKeith came along, poo was a subject as taboo as sex, especially in the UK. And just as sex is certainly never easy subject to discuss, your bowels and their regularity take on much of the same awkward tone. To help me with my clients, I have two charts. One's called the Bist Bristol Stool Chart, and the other is from a book by Paul Check called How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. It gives names and faces to all the potential states of bowel, uh, bowels and the consistency, and they're all dressed up in little outfits. It's called the Poopy Policeman Lineup. A lot of people do not know what their bowels look like, or how often they go, being regular by whose standards. I remember lady, a lady once proudly telling me of her regularity of bowel movement. It was only when I asked her what her regular was that we discovered she was chronically constipated. Twice a week is regular if that's what you do every week, but it's certainly not normal. The bowel should move roughly 30 centimeters, 12 inches of feces every day. That's the optimum regularity we should all be striving for. So if you are moving your bowels once, once or three times a day, if you've been moving your bowels less than this and you've been told it's normal, it isn't. It's just very, very common. Um, my name's Hannah Richards. I'm the author of The Best, Possi uh, Best Possible You. Um, it's a unique guide to being able to heal your body nutritionally. So one of the things I always ask people is, have you got the guts for good skin? The skin is one of the, is the largest organ in your body and it's a really good mirror as to what's going on inside you, inside you and with you and for you and all those things. So when we talk about the human body, I'm talking about the physical, the mental, the emotional and the physical. And they all sing and dance together. You can't single one thing out in the body. Um, some, some types of medicine try to do that, but really it's about looking at all those different bodies as a whole. Um, as Adriana said, um, I work as a nutritionist and lifestyle coach on South Moulton Street. I used to run a health clinic in um, Hampstead called Move360. Um, I founded a juice company for medicinal uh, juicing, which ran a range of juices and shots, which were all for different organs and systems. Um, and so I'm mainly in Somerset now and in London. So today I'm going to try and be a little bit interactive if you're all up for being a bit of a health detective with each other. Um, you certainly don't have to at all, you can opt out. But the best thing about being a nutritionist is really is that it's just a bit of, it's like being a detective. I look at a person and try and figure out what's going on with them. I do this by the way they email me, the way they fill in their paperwork, uh, the timings that they do that with, the language they use, 
what their skin looks like, what their hair looks like, what their fingernails look like. I even get them to stick their tongue out to me because I can tell a lot from organ systems with the tongue. And so it's really sort of mapping all these things to be able to find out what is the etiology, what is the root cause of the ill health that a person is experiencing. It's worth just saying at this point that they're all just little uh, signs. So if you have dark circle under your eyes and we say that's the detoxification system and the liver, you don't have a chronic liver disorder. It's just one, uh, one pathway in the right direction. So the skin is a great insight into your gut. Um, and the face gives us, uh, has anyone heard of face mapping or done sort of acupuncture? And so a lot of this is all very Eastern medicine as well. In Western medicine, we tend to look through, uh, through a hole and see one, one thing and fix that one thing without trying to look at the reasons as to why we got there in the first place. Um, and so this is all about looking at the signs and symptoms before disease rears its ugly head. I'm sure we've all got symptoms here. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but we collect them on a daily, yearly basis. And the problem is with symptoms is that they just fall into this place of normality. So we put up with them for so long, they become normal. Then we play the genetic card. My mum has it, my dad has it, it's in the family, it's part of us, it's who we are. And that's all very true, but it's also quite a nice, convenient excuse not to take responsibility for our own health. Um, so your tongue is, um, again, it's going to show you where all the organs are. I'm going to show you exactly the markings and the colorations of your tongue so you can go and have a look at it and see how you could improve and whether those markings match the symptoms that you're experiencing as well. Hair is um, a great one for absorption. Um, it's, it's cool for men to lose their hair. It's not so cool for women to lose their hair. And yet it's one of the biggest things I see in clinic more than probably after constipation is hair thinning. thinning. Um, and that's got to do with our digestive systems. Our digestive capabilities are so poor these days and that's because of stress. And it's because of the bad food choices that we have because the way the world has made us into little robots and it's basically stress and stress, as we'll learn a bit later, the biggest impact of it is on our digestive system. Nails, um, lucky for you if you've got nail polish on. Um, if you haven't, we're going to go through some nail things and we can look at each other's nails. So really easy things to look at as well, look out for. Bowels, um, you know, if you don't look at them, start looking at them. They're the biggest predictors of health. Um, they tell you so much about what's going on in you. Um, urine and then viscerosomatic pain patterns. So that's sort of like, is, has anyone ever been to, had a, a, an injury? Of course. Um, and you go to the physio or the osteopath and you keep going and you don't really feel like you're getting anywhere. Well, when that happens, what, you need, what we need to start doing is looking at the nerve feeds to the organ. So if your spine is a long column, all the nerves feed off the, sp uh, off the vertebrae into your organs. So when uh, your right shoulder hurts, for example, and you can't, it, no, no mechanical therapy was working, you need to start looking at the liver, whether it's sluggish, whether it needs detoxing, whether it's got fibrosis, all these sorts of things. So it's the organ systems that need to start to be looked at. The other thing to say about the book as well is that every organ takes you through an emotion. Um, again, in Chinese traditional medicine, we believe that every organ is associated with an, an emotion. So sometimes the reason that um, initially there's a problem can be a, an emotional issue rather than anything else. Um, the liver, for example, is uh, anger and frustration. And again, it's the one that I work with most in clinic because we're all stressed, tired, and little addicts. 
we're, we're always sort of profiling each other all the time in your jobs. You've all worked here because you're really good at what you do. And, and it's the same in, how, in being, being a nutritionist. I'm just looking at people and going, what is going on with this person? Why is their skin presenting with a big red flush on their cheeks? Why does their face look like it has this hue of tiredness? Um, and so you've just looked at each other and you've probably spotted things um, and that's what I want you to do to yourselves. Start noticing what's changing in you because when things change, they're signs and symptoms of whether you're going to go towards health or whether you're going to move towards a state of dis-ease. Symptoms live next to the door of disease and not health. So the more symptoms you start collecting that you decide to call normal, the further and longer it takes to move away and get better. So that's just worth remembering. So fingernails. Has anyone had like split fingernails? This is a really easy one. So sometimes your fingernails get a bit brittle and they break. Now, for ladies, it can be because we use nail polish. I've got nail polish on, can't see mine. Um, <laughs> It can be because we, acetone is such a, a horrible uh, um, thing to put on our nails so it breaks them and makes them weak. But if, you, if they do break all the time, it can be a sign that you're not absorbing protein well enough. So we, we might be eating enough protein and we can eat all the best organic food in the world, but another question is whether we absorb it. And that's the biggest relationship with digestion and hormones. We can eat all the best things, but if we don't absorb it, it's, it, it's, it's almost doesn't make, it, make any difference. Um, lunars, anyone know what your lunars are? The lunars are like the little half moon, so just look right at the bottom of your nail beds. You should have almost, you should have about eight lunars. Um, sometimes people don't have any lunars at all. Sometimes it can be a, a sign of B12 deficiency, and again, that can um, come in, maybe tie in with a brittle nail and protein absorption as well. Um, Sometimes people have longitudinal lines along the nail bed. Um, this can be an iron deficiency, a folic acid deficiency. Um, sometimes you can have fallen over, had a trauma to the nail bed and then they never grow back. So that's something to consider as well. Um, sometimes if you have a red line by the top of the nail, sort of on all of them where it looks a little bit red, that's a sign of a, a kidney detoxification issue or certainly needs a bit of help in those um, organs as well. And then probably one of the most common ones, those little white pittings on the nail. Yeah? And people are probably growing up, everyone's like, oh, it's calcium, don't drink enough milk. Because <laughs> milk's the only source of calcium. It's actually a zinc deficiency. And zinc is one of my favorite supplements of all time. It's responsible for so much. Zinc is one of the cofactors for making hydrochloric acid, which lives in your stomach, which helps you do everything basically in your world. And we see more um, acid reflux, we'll probably get onto this a bit later, but acid reflux, anyone with indigestion, is a, um, is, it's because of a deficiency in hydrochloric acid. Adult onset acne, for example, is a deficiency in zinc. So zinc only likes to be uptaken by itself, so if you're thinking about getting some zinc or you have zinc, you should take it last thing at night, um, not with anything else. If you feel sick whenever taking a supplement, or especially zinc, sometimes you can, then it's a sign that your digestive capabilities, the enzymes, are quite low, so you can't break it down. If you can't break down food, you can't break down a supplement. Um, so you can take a whole load of things, but again, if you don't have the enzymes or the bile or the acids to break things down, then again, it's a little bit pointless. So obviously healthy nails, um, you should be able to hold them down and the blood disappears and it pops back up. Um, and if that happens, that's great. If not, um, another little trick if you're dehydrated, maybe on a Friday morning, you can uh, pick your skin up and it should, it should hold. If there's enough water in you, it should hold a little bit. So you should be able to see the skin fall as opposed to 
completely disappear. So if it disappears without you being able to see it, drink some more water. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a warning about the next slide. So these are, um, so this is the longitudinal one, which is maybe sometimes the iron deficiency. And sometimes nails also quite give you big signs about cardiovascular, like some of these nails look very white and pale. You know, the blood isn't pumping around the body enough. And um, at the surface of the skin are all the capillaries, so we should always see this redness, which is why if you do the nail test, you should be able to see a lot of redness it disappears and then pops back up again. Um, that's the pitting, which is the zinc deficiency. This is the brittle nails. So if you have got this and it's a pro it could be a protein deficient uh, uh, malabsorption, <coughs> then things like taking in proteins in a more digestible form, like chicken soup, like bone broth, like collagen, all these things, it's, it's almost like someone's done the chewing for you. So it's less stress on the body. You're just going to take it all in. Um, now the toe, this is like a systemic fungal infection. And often you see this in um, people with Alzheimer's and dementia where the body is just constantly breaking down. Sometimes the beginning of a fungal infection can present with maybe a black, spot on a toenail. It's normally always the toenails and not the fingers. Um, but this is when the, whether the fungal infection, which is a yeast overgrowth, has really got out of hand. So sometimes we might see a yeast overgrowth on a tongue. Um, you might see it vaginally. You might see, uh, feel it like in the nasal area. Basically, every orifice we have, if it's inflamed, if the body's inflamed and unhappy, it will try and excrete. It wants to get stuff out. And it does that by getting rid of mucus and things like that. Um, so all these also, like the flakiness around the cuticle, these are deficiencies in things like essential, essential fatty acids, your omegas that you get from your fish and your avocados and all these things as well. So everything is giving you uh, an indication that not all is well. And the longer you put up with stuff, you know, there's that saying, the longer you put off health, the lo you're going to have to find time later to make it up. So it's really worthwhile looking out for these signs and symptoms because they're really easy to fix. Um, I think with people with like adult onset acne, zinc is a really easy way to um, improve that for sure uh, because it's the start of the digestive process. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, anything gut related within two to four weeks, if you do it all sort of 95%, you're going to see differences because of the cell turnover. Um, it's only when people commit to things like 60 or 7%, 70%, then results don't really show. Um, okay, so face mapping. Apologies if you, can you see that? I, I'll point through it. So we probably all know that when we've gone out and had a bit too much to drink, we wake up in the morning, we've got bloodshot eyes. Certainly if you've got Caucasian skin, it is a thankless, it's, it shows everything. You know, that no amount of makeup is going to cover up a big night out. Um, and mainly we see it right under the eyes here. And they either, they, they're very black, they're sort of purpley, you can see all the tones in them. And that is because you've overloaded the detoxification system and the kidneys and the liver are under a bit of stress. Um, you'll also notice that when you're on a really nice health cleanse and you're feeling really good, that you don't have those dark circles under your eyes. Now, if you always have the dark circles under your eyes, then that's definitely one of those sort of markers to go, oh, maybe I need to look at my kidney, my gallbladder, my liver, the detoxification system, because maybe it's not functioning as well as it could. In the book, there's a, a case study on the kidneys with a, a, a friend I got to know. And I always thought that he just didn't look very well. And it was only later that we discovered, well, he told me, because he only discovered it late in life, that he only had one kidney. 
Um, and he only found out when he was sort of 44. I have another friend who has like four kidneys. Um, so sometimes you just don't know what's going on if you don't ask the questions or investigate or are aware of your signs and symptoms. Um, down here is another place of kidneys. I should probably see it more in men than women, like sometimes a bit of cracking here. Um, hormonally for women under the chin and for men, but obviously women will see it through the cycle, the changes, sort of spots or things around here. If you have any sort of pussy sort of spots, then that's your lymphatic system. Try, it's got too much toxicity in it. Um, and your lymph system is like a system all over the body that's designed to drive toxicity out, um, you know, like the motility of the, the, the peristalsis. Um, red cheeks, um, sometimes they call it but the butterfly effect or um, rosacea. Um, but for me, it's low hydrochloric acid. So the acid, acid lives in your stomach, it breaks down protein. And when you struggle with, uh, with, let's say you had acid reflux, for example, or indigestion, that would be a sign that your acid was low. If the acid is low in the stomach, then you've got more chance of uh, picking up pathogens, antigens, crossing over into the bloodstream because it, ha they, it hasn't been washed by the acid. It's a bit like the theory of why we have to wash before we go into a public swimming pool full of chlorine. Um, but it's the same thing. If there's no acid in your stomach, then nothing gets washed. It's the first line of defense. So if you suddenly feel like maybe you can't eat meat as well as you used to, or fat makes you feel a little bit sick, these could all be signs that you've got a low hydrochloric acid. Or equally, if you do have acid reflux or indigestion, again, that's low hydrochloric acid. Now, some of you may be thinking she's got that completely the wrong way around uh, because the medical industry think that that is true. And so what they do is give you Rene tablets to dampen down a level of acid that you don't already have, thereby depleting the acid levels that you have, thereby not giving you a line of defense. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. But it's, uh, and Rene's are never going to solve the problem. They're a plaster to not really getting to the etiology of why we have acid reflux in the first place. The other reason it could be because it's um, a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori, which all, again, only exists, only can survive if there is no acid in the stomach. Otherwise, the acid would kill, would kill it. So if I took some acid out of your stomach, uh, it would burn a hole in your genes. I mean, it's that potent. So if your stomach is an alkaline uh, environment, it's not going to be breaking down any food. That's why we feel full, we feel bloated, we create fermentation, we get SIBO, and you can see how it's just a knock-on effect. Um, Sometimes here they call uh, the lines down here uh, sort of the liver, angry lines, alcohol, to maybe an addiction to alcohol. Um, the nose, we say, is the, when it sort of flares up red, is the pancreas, the sweetness of life. Blood um, handling issues um, are always looked at there. Um, so there's lots of reasons and there's lots of signs and symptoms on your face and it's good to be always looking at those changes as well. Um, on the skin, anyone ever got like little pimply bits on their arms? That's, a thing, that's something called keratosis, keratosis pilaris. Um, sometimes you can get it on the back of your legs. It's an essential fatty acid deficiency. Um, really easy to get rid of or well I say easy the thing is with supplements is you've got to force a change in the body so if you're taking one omega-3 every day or one probiotic you're not really going to change the status in what's going on in your body uh, and that's why if you're not testing for things then we're just guessing with a dosage that someone somewhere has recommended to take we really want to get everything we all our nutrients in through our food um, but keratosis pilaris, you'd need a really high amount of omega-3s, essential fatty acids, to shift that condition. Um, okay, so here we go to the tongue. 
So I'll just do the digestive sy system mainly. Um, so when you stick your tongue out, A, you want it to hold. Some people's tongues shake. That's a magnesium deficiency. It's stress. Um, we have this autonomic nervous system. Has anyone heard of that? A little bit. Um, on one side, you have the sympathetic nervous system. The other side, you have the parasympathetic nervous system. For example, the digestive system has to be parasympathetic to, to not be constipated, to move freely through the intestines, out through the colon. So all the stressed people you know, they're probably constipated. All the happy-go-lucky, yeah, let's, no problem. They're never going to be constipated. They're like, hold on, I just need the loo. Whereas the stressed people are like, you know, they're living in this sympathetic zone all the time. Everything's tight, everything's shortened. And so it's just a knock-on effect. The breathing changes, the posture changes, the musculoskeletal system changes. They're, you know, and so... Your, there are signs and symptoms of organs and diseases that live on the sympathetic side and others that live on the parasympathetic side. So the digestive system, right down the middle of your tongue, if there are any cracks in it, then this is definitely looking at a digestive issue here. Sometimes then you'll have these little fissures that come off that big ridge in the middle and you might have gas, bloating, colitis, Colitis is a condition I see more than anything. And it's really an emotional issue that comes from high levels of stress. Um, colitis can, is, uh, it presents in the large intestines, whereas Crohn's presents in the whole gastro tract. Um, and all that is happening is that nothing is being absorbed. So people find themselves um, going to the bathroom up to 20 times a day. So if they're, comp if they're always excreting, uh, then they're not hanging, they're not taking in any vitamins, minerals, any nutrition. So they're always drained, they're always tired. And then that has a knock-on effect to the emotional status of anxiety, not wanting to eat, not wanting to go out because you have this chronic bowel issue. Um, so the other really obvious one, I guess, would be a white tongue. Um, obviously you can eat foods and see different colors. But a white tongue, again, that would be looking at potentially a yeast infection. Um, sometimes it can change the times of the month as well. Um, so right down at the front, the tip of the tongue, you've got the heart. Either side of the left and the right lung. Right in the middle is the stomach. So that's where you mainly see the, the fissures splitting off from the longitudinal ridge down the middle. And that's because so many people have issues with hydrochloric acid production. And then the intestines at the back as well. So what a good thing to do is stick your tongue out when you get home, take a picture of it. And if you're going to change your nutrition or some things in life, then that's a good marker of how things have changed. So this is a nice, healthy tongue. It doesn't have that longitudinal ridge right down the middle. Um, it's not scalloped down the side. Sometimes you can see these sort of teeth marks in the side of people's tongues. Um, this is a, a beefy tongue, <laughs> uh, which is a <laughs> B12 deficiency. Like sometimes tongue <laughs> people's tongues are a bit too big for their mouths. That's, that's a be big beefy tongue. Um, this is the papillae in this one is a bacterial infection. So when the papillae open, when the fissures have been uh, open for too long, then it collects bacteria and it looks like it's a bit black like that. And so you're constantly carrying around um, toxicity. It's like people who smoke and chew gum at the same time. You know, it's like the quickest way to have a problem. This is, I always call, this is called a geographical tongue, but I like to see it as, you know when you cut open a red cabbage? Looks a bit like that, doesn't it? So this is like a huge, long-time metabolic syndrome. So there's a, lots of issues going on there. You don't see it um, a lot, but you definitely see it. So tongue health is really important. Chinese traditional medicine swears by it, and they live by it, and they are constantly checking tongue health. 
Um, then we've got the referred pain patterns. Um, in the book, there's a, a chart to tell you which organs belong to which parts of the vertebrae. Um, so if you do have an injury or a chronic pain and you haven't been able to fix it, it's definitely time to look at your organ system. Um, just checking the time. Okay, so I'm going to really quickly go through one organ with you all. And I picked the liver because it's the grandfather of all organs and we're all such workaholics these days and we probably do things to excess, I'm guessing. Um, so I thought I'd go through the liver and tell you what the job of it is. So the liver is a little bit like a hoover. Who here hoovers? <laughs> All you men. <laughs> um, and when your hoover bag gets full, what do you do? Empty it, absolutely. Because it can't pick up the dirt on the floor anymore. Now, if you think of your liver a bit like a hoover, when it gets full, what do we do? Carry on, <laughs> because we're not listening to the signs and the symptoms. So when those dark circles don't go, when, you're, when, the, when your back, upper back hurts, when your urine is constantly dark, when you feel a bit narky more than usual, you have a bit of anger, frustration, all these things going on, you, you're sort of reaching for the biscuit more than the fruit. These are all signs that the liver is a little bit overloaded and needs filtering out. Now, green juice will help, but it's definitely not a detox. Um, because if the liver isn't working, what happens is a rehepatic circulation. So it's, it's what I call ghetto gut. You sort of do a cleanse for two weeks, but because no filtration is happening, you're just circulating the toxins back from the digestive system to the liver and back, and they're not leaving. Does that make sense? Um, so, if you feel like you can't lose weight, if you feel like you're fat, fed up and fatigued or any one of those, then you might, and you've looked at lots of things, the gym stopped working, the salmon and green, uh, green lettuce isn't working either, you know, getting into bed, not going out with your friends, you feel like you're in a bit of a conundrum, it's time to look at your liver because it just gets a bit sluggish. And like everyone in life, when we're sluggish, we don't really perform very well. Um, and those are all the things that you might start seeing. Um, again, in the book, every organ gives you this kind of chart. So the liver is a yin organ, it's a female organ. Um, if you know about chakras, then the main sort of purpose of, uh, of the liver is personal power and self-will, which is why I often see with people, uh, the anger and frustration comes out in its addictive nature. Um, so you can be addicted to anything, you can be addicted to alcohol, you can be addicted to health, you know, um, but that normally comes out in, uh, in, in the liver. Um, so those are just, the, in the book, all, all the organs have that meridian chart. There you go. Henry the Hoover. So how do you start fixing your liver or how do you help it along? All your green foods are the best things. They're full of magnesium. If you're tired and stressed, magnesium is one of the best supplements you can take. Obviously, internally, it's going to help the bowels move. It creates diarrhea, if you like. If you overdose with magnesium, expect to see some diarrhea. Um, everyone's dosage is different, so you just have to titrate, uh, which means take one tablet one day, the next day up, regulate to two, and so on until you get the desired effect. If you start taking supplements all at once, you'll have no idea what works and what doesn't. So always take them one at a time. So all your green foods. Um, it's worth saying as well that with our green vegetables and everything, we're also into raw these days, raw and vegan. And that's great, but if you have a digestive issue, your body does not want to break down raw food. It wants it steamed, it wants it cooked because it's easier for the digestive system. So if you blow after a salad, stop eating salads and go to steamed vegetables. Um, I work in Cairo at a, a place over there and everyone is bloated and constipated. Um, it's because they, when they eat well, they eat salad and chicken, and when they don't, 
they, you know, they're doing everything, they're doing everything else. So when I take them off the salad and the raw food, their digestive uh, capabilities get better and their um, bloating comes down. Bloating is just a symptom of the gut being weak. Food intolerances, we're, the major five intolerances are uh, cow's milk, egg, nut, wheat, and, and uh, gluten. And so these are the things we eat more all the time. I grew up on cereal, which was basically wheat, gluten, and milk. So there's three straight away. So the more you eat of something, the more you wear down the digestive enzymes that get to break down that food, and then you end up with a bloating. If I took out your gut and I laid it on the floor, it would cover half a tennis court. And the whole gut is covered in microvilli. And at the top of the villi are villi and they excrete enzymes. So if you overdo milk your whole life, then you wear out the enzymes that break down the milk. And then when you put milk back into the gut, it bloats out because the, the gut's almost like bald. It's like a bald head. There's no means to break the food down into smaller particles to cross over and be absorbed and digested. Um, so a food intolerance, when you, when you feel like you bloat and you can't pinpoint what you bloat at and you now feel like it's just everything, that's when we need to start repairing the permeability of the gut lining. So if you bloat with a certain food, it's easy, take it out. Um, but if it feels like suddenly it becomes everything you're bloating at, then you need to start fixing the, the inside of the lining. Um, so sometimes the liver is all about, it's about anger and jealousy. Obviously we see lots of addictions. Um, depression as well, which is linked to the bacteria in the microbiome, um, which is a huge subject. Um, but one thing I would say quickly about probiotic bacteria, if you eat a really good varied diet, you don't really need them. If you are taking them and you're taking one a day, it's a bit of a waste of time. You need to make sure they're multi-strained and every three months you change your probiotic. You know, your microbiome is full of bacteria, billions, trillions. So if you're just putting one lactobacillus in, you know, it's hard work. Um, so you need to be putting a multitude of bacteria back in the gut. And why not do that with food? Why not do that with kefir, with kombucha, with sauerkraut, with kimchi, with fermented things, with soy, rather than very expensive probiotics? Um, if you've been on antibiotics or you've had trauma, then absolutely there's a need for them. But if you're a healthy looking person, which you all look like to me, and you're spending money on probiotics and they're not really doing anything, then they're probably not. Um, here are some supplements for your liver. One of my favorite is B6. If women, for example, get tender breasts the week before their period, that's um, definitely a deficiency in B6. B6 is like the little cofactor guy that makes everything in the body work. So you can't go wrong by taking a bit of B6. Um, NAC, N-acetylcysteine, is a, is a really potent uh, antioxidant. Um, it's a precursor of glutathione. Um, if you were to take milk, any of these before you drank and the day after, you would repair your hangover quite well um, because it helps. Everyone's like, uh, because, because it helps do the detoxification. Um, it's always best to take herbs naturally as opposed to in a supplementation form. Uh, but NAC or glutathione is exponentially one of the best things you can take. You can get glutathione in a shot form um, and take, have it injected into the muscle and it completely, you know, if, if you're in drug rehab therapy, you'd be on shots of NAC all the time. And glutathione, it's just more expensive. <coughs> Magnesium, if you're stressed, it's the biggest uh, supplement for your heart, especially men. Um, so if you feel like you're always running uphill against the tide, then make sure you've got some magnesium in your life. If you're chronically constipated and you drink enough water and you eat your steamed greens, take some magnesium. If you don't eat enough greens and drink water, then do that first. 
Um, so here's a big tip if you have got digestive issues. Always eat at the same time every day. Your body's a bit like a baby. When a baby cries, what does it need? It either needs some love, needs some food, or it needs a poo. And we are no different. And what we do all the time is we keep our bodies guessing. We wake up in the morning, we go straight to hit. We don't give it any water, we don't give it any food. We keep it up till 2 a.m. We wake up at 6, we go to work. You know, the amount of clients I see who go, God, I haven't got any water today, and they're fishing around in the room for water. We've got to look after our bodies if we want them to work for us. And the signs and the symptoms are the easiest way that you can do this. Our health is our responsibility. Yeah, there are genetic, chronic, life-defined diseases that we, that we get in the world, but most of the time, it's up to us. And if you're looking at all the things that we've been through today, if you're aware when things don't work or do work, if you're aware of your emotional status and your physicality and how you eat, then you'll probably be okay. And if you're not, then you've got some tools in your toolbox now to start being even more optimum than you probably are. So my challenge to you all is spend the net tomorrow, I know you all eat here, so that's really, it's not really a challenge for you guys. At the weekend, here we go, at the weekend. You can't eat anything that's been packaged, wrapped, or sold in plastic. <laughs> Sounds easy, but report back. <laughs> and that means it's the easiest thing to do because then we have to prepare our food. And I'm just going to do one last thing. So if you could open them that way. And what I want you both to do is just open them and smell them. And then pass them around. Everyone smell these crisps. We don't. <laughs> you can. You can. They're butts. They're quite good crisps. So is anyone feeling like they've got more saliva going around in their mouth? So what you've just created is the most essential thing you need to create for digestion. And it's called the cephalic response. If you don't create the cephalic response, then you do not create the enzymes that are required to, uh, to break the food down. And because we're all on our computers and we're always working from our desk, we don't create the cephalic response, and that is the major reason why people find their way to me. And so sometimes I say, are you a fast eater? And they go, yeah, yeah, no, I'm really fast. And I'm like, well, come back when you slow down. Because it's the only thing people need to do is chew. If you don't prepare yourself, it's like anything in life. If you don't prepare, then you don't get the desired effects. So the cephalic response is the start and end of optimum digestion. And it gets created when uh, we smell vinegar and salt. Um, so some top tips, 10 minutes before you eat, obviously think about what you want to eat. Um, also, we, we, can't, we have to get off these machines to, to eat. You know, the body is in this hierarchical state of survival and more energy gets diverted to our eyes because it's, uh, our eyes are always looking out for safety. And so when you're eating, reading a report, more energy is going to the optical nerves than it is to your digestive system. So you're not gonna digest very well. So the easiest thing, and I don't understand why human beings can't do it, is have a break. Take an hour off for lunch or half an hour and sit down and enjoy the food with your friends. If you've got digestive issues and you do that, you probably won't have them. So create the cephalic response, turn your phone off and enjoy food because by all means, we're all eating it a lot during the day, aren't we? You know, we're like, we're little guzzlers. We're always looking and, and here there's food everywhere, right? There's food everywhere. I mean, you guys are eating whether you're hungry or not. Um, so we need to make sure that we're hungry for the food and you do that by creating meal times. So anyway, I hope you found it useful 
Um, and if you've got any questions here, I'm more than happy to answer them. I know some people have to go. I'm going to be around for the next half an hour, so fire away. <coughs> Um, so thank you very much, uh, really great talk, really enjoyed all of that. Um, my question was, you spoke a lot about food. Um, I know you're probably going to say it's bad, but just um, interested to get your thoughts on caffeine and caffeine <coughs> levels um, that are uh, Yeah, no, good question. I love coffee. Um, it's the question of why you need coffee. So if you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, I can't wait for coffee, then you might have a bit of a... Um, an energy issue there. Um, if you drink instant coffee, you're going to rip your gut up in one felt smooth in, in really easily. So instant coffee is one of the worst things you can do for your gut. If you have coffee um, after you eat water, food, and then coffee, that's my general rule. Um, never have coffee between the hours of 11 and 1 because it's the hours of the heart. And the heart is all about hate and love and shock. And just as much as we can, the heart can get shocked through a good thing and a bad thing, you don't really want those hours to be, that's why it's lunchtime. Yeah, and that's why we want to be sat down, relaxed, in a relaxed state. And coffee perks you up and sends shocks around the body. So uh, if you're hydrated enough, drink it. But drink it away from food. And if you've got more than two a day, three a day, you know, you're masking something. So... But uh, yeah, it's essentially, if coffee, if you drink coffee and you get heart palpitations, then put some fat in it, like put some coconut oil in it, some butter in it, you know, good milk in it. That's the fat that makes the energy go for longer. Thanks so much. Really interesting. Um, I was just curious if you could talk anything about um, the Ayurvedic system. Mm -hmm. um, you'd mentioned, you know, steaming vegetables versus eating them raw. Yeah. And I was just curious if you see that kind of in the practice or if you if you think it's a good idea or kind of people should steer away from it. Yeah, no, good uh, question. So the so Ayurveda is like an old Indian wisdom, traditional system of of nutrition and yoga, essentially, and a way of life. Uh, we call, they call the Agni, the Agni is your digestive system, so it's always about lighting the fire in the body. If your Agni is strong, then you'll be able to break down foods. So I always see the digestive system a little bit like a fire. If, you're, if you don't know how your body works, like in Ayurveda, there's three doshas, Kapha, Pitta, Vata. Um, and, you, and it's all about whether you're putting in cooling foods or warming foods, but foods that stimulate that digestive fire. So if you're always putting in paper to a fire, what essentially happens to the fire? It goes out. So if you're always putting Haribos into your body uh, because you constantly need energy, you'll always be crashing and burning. If you put wood into that fire, it burns for a long time. You can get on with your day um, and it's sustainable. And that's about Ayurveda finding the right mix of foods or metabolic typing. Once you've found your own individual makeup, then you understand how to feed your body to keep the agony, the fire in. I follow it a lot, yep. I guess on the back of her question, um, would you recommend one versus the other or is it all personal? Should I have steamed or raw or is it a rule I think of thumb? It's, yeah, it's very much, um, I, uh, when I first got into nutrition, I found it pretty illogical and a bit green farmerish. how I have bad skin, okay, take this pharmaceutical drug. I have bad skin, take some vitamin E. Um, and so I found a type of nutrition called metabolic typing, which basically says that we're all different. So you can be uh, a fast oxidizer, a slow oxidizer, a mixed oxidizer, and some people burn. If you go back to your biology lessons at school, and you go back to the Krebs cycle, beta oxidation, all that. Yeah, you've all wiped it out, I can see. Um, it's all about how we burn different fuels for energy. I, I burn fat and protein quite sustainably. Carbohydrates I burn really quickly. Some people use, so I don't use them very well. 
you might use carbohydrates really well. Um, and so once you find your mix, then you can, th then you're feeling more optimal um, all the time. Um, so it is very individual. Um, but essentially, if you're a fully functional, if you have a fully functional gut, you should be able to take, eat anything. You know, we're not designed to be gluten free. It's because our guts are a bit m mucked up these days that we're all now got, you know, tags over us that we've all got these conditions that, you know, make it, make, have made us gone a bit crazy. You mentioned about uh, keeping ourselves hydrated and that's good for our digestive systems. So do you have any recommendation about the temperature of the water? Yeah, so water should all, always be room temperature because the stu anything like really ice cold, certainly in Ayurveda, um, but the stomach doesn't want Chinese traditional medicine. Cold water is just a shock to the body. Like it's okay outside. I do a lot of cold water swimming, um, swimming in Hampstead Heath. And that, because that stimulates your vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is the 10th th cranial nerve that is responsible for the di di digestion in your body. But when the water's going into you, then it's too much of a shock and a sympathetic response, a stress release to the body. So room temperature all the time. Yeah. Thank you very much for the inspirational talk. <coughs> and my question is on superfoods. They're super yeah. popular nowadays. Yeah. How much do you recommend them? How much should we take on a daily basis? And how much should we avoid them, if at all? Sure. Um, I always think that, I don't know, a group of journalists would sit around a table or PR people and they'd be like, what should we call a superfood today? <laughs> Shall it be kiwis? Shall it be apples? I mean, they have this sort of hierarchical uh, status when they shouldn't. All food is fairly equal when it's seasonal, when it's organic, when it's c from the country of origin. So superfoods for me, a bit, bit of a phenomenon that I don't really understand. Um, and a bit, the, the, the press have made them to be gimmicky. So blueberries are a superfood. Why is blueberry a superfood, not a strawberry? You know, um, I think if, if that's the point, if, and if I've answered your question well enough, I think if you're eating seasonally, then you're doing a really good job. And therefore, everything is superfood in that season. Cool. Well done. Well, thank you, Hannah. And if you have questions to her individually, if you don't want to talk out loud, I'm sure she'd be open to Yeah. Um, I've got some cards and some little book things there, but absolutely, um, if you have any questions um, about your bowels and you want to <laughs> private email me, I'm very, I'm all ears. <laughs>